Today is a little bit of a different sort of video. Consider this a mixture of a GigaChad guide and a video essay. Thus it shall be deemed a GigaChad essay. I guess. Let's start off 2023 with a new type of video, because I think that'll be fun. The subject for today's video will be Krakow, but on a larger basis, insignificant powers in general, and the place that they hold in the fun of Victoria 3. I wrote up a pretty big video essay a while ago critiquing Victoria 3 in general, but I think a more focused and shorter video like this one will do a better job of expressing some of my grievances with the game. Rest assured, I will show you how to play Krakow like a GigaChad, but along the way, I'm going to talk a bit about my opinions on the gameplay behind specifically insignificant powers, and why I don't particularly enjoy playing these sorts of nations. Let's look at this tiny Polish city-state, its unique government, and the opportunity it has to become a paradise under the Austrian market. First off, Krakow has a pretty unique set of laws. They've got laissez-faire economics, and I believe it's the only nation to have it at game start. They've also got free trade, which as a landlocked subject nation is kind of pointless. The price for these pretty great starting laws is that you're an Austrian puppet and you're a tiny country with a low population, very few resources, and surrounded by three of the greatest powers in the game. While being stuck with Austria means you're a puppet, and therefore pay a puppet tax, it also means you get access to Austria's entire market. While the AI isn't the best about building up a solid base of natural resources, we can certainly mooch off of Austria's much larger market for the time being. We're going to leverage this to provide some high quality jobs for our people through a complete dependence on raw materials industry from outside our own nation. We could essentially just build up industries like textiles, arts, steel, and other powerful industries that give out good jobs without having to create a raw materials industry which wouldn't provide as good a selection of jobs. My goal for this run is going to be becoming a city-state paradise here in Krakow which means I'll be prioritizing that over getting freedom or expanding beyond this tiny piece of West Galicia. I'm thinking of hitting the top 10 powers, highest GDP per capita, and highest standard of living in the world as a reasonable demonstration of both how to play Krakow and how to show what I don't really like about playing nations like this one. This run is going to be pretty slow by the nature of our lack of a construction sector, but that will quickly accelerate thanks to laissez-faire. Thanks to our economic policy, we can gain an investment pool extremely quickly, and because we aren't going to do much agriculture, laissez-faire will help us build everything we need. To start though, we don't have much, so we'll have to build without any speed. In the meantime, I'm going to go for cultural exclusion, which in combination with our total separation and religious policy, means anyone can come to Krakow. This will keep our workforce nice and large, and it'll even weaken our overlord, Austria, since we'll be sapping workers from them. Given how much population Austria has though, we'd have to sap some millions of people from them for it to really matter much, and that'll take a long time. I don't intend to play long enough to really see the effect of that. So what's the plan? Build up profitable industries, welcome immigrants, and watch the standard of living shoot through the roof. Let me talk about why I don't like this particular playstyle. When you play an insignificant power, several aspects of Victoria 3's gameplay cease to exist effectively. First off, great power politics goes away. What I mean by that is simple. One of the most fun parts of Victoria 3 is the balance of powers between all the world powers vying for control over resources and land. That entire gameplay loop is replaced with attempting to reach great power status so that you can participate in that mechanic. You might say it's something of a quid pro quo, exchange the great power politics of great major and minor powers for the gameplay of reaching great power status. What doesn't work out so well for this idea though is that the gameplay loop of playing an insignificant power is horrifically boring. I want to make it clear that this doesn't apply to major or minor powers. Miners and mages are perfect to play because they usually have enough power to be a meaningful force in the thematic and economic stage. That means they can contribute to great power politics, but they just can't drive it forward the way the great powers do. For example, in conflicts of the Middle East, nations like Egypt and Persia genuinely can exert their power, despite not being great powers. This is not the case for insignificant powers. A nation like the Trucial States is essentially powerless and completely lacking any kind of content. Ask yourself this when you play a nation like Krakow. What are you doing? Normally, Victoria 3's gameplay loop is composed of resource acquisition, playing the diplomatic field, internal politics, and economy planning. Only one of those mechanics exists as an insignificant power. So I ask again, what are you doing as Krakow? In my case, it is watching buildings get built and improving relations with Prussia and Russia in the hopes that they might help me fight Austria one day. I'm also passing some laws that will benefit my nation, and I'm just kind of chilling. My diplomacy is limited to whoever is in my immediate vicinity because I can't declare interests. Not that this diplomacy would mean anything due to the fact that my nation is too weak to sway the desires of any great power. 
My internal politics are non-existent, since as a single state, nation with no army, and an overlord, civil wars are meaningless even if one were to break out. This means I can pass whatever law I want, with whatever government I want, whenever I want. I don't have any opportunity for resource acquisition, since even if I could declare diplomatic plays, a great power would simply stop me from doing so. That leaves you with economic planning. Not much planning to do, but it is at least some kind of gameplay. Now, don't get me wrong, I actually do somewhat enjoy just watching numbers go up. To me, it's a lot like playing something like City Skylines. You just sort of build things and watch your population, approval, and income go up. It's a game you play for the zen of it more than the challenge, and that game is good because of its aesthetic. Its mechanics are clearly built around being a bit of a casual game. Victoria 3, however, is not like City Skylines. There's no aesthetic or flavor to the way I run my nation. I'm simply running the nation in the way which best suits my mechanical goals. It is possible to roleplay in any game, let alone Victoria 3, but there are no systems for roleplay with any meaningful value in this game. It's not like I have any flavor with which to imagine the way of life that my people enjoy. When my standard of living hits like 30, there's no consequence outside of the mechanical implications of it. In CK3, having maximum fame has a mechanical implication, but it also creates a story around how that fame was acquired. Maybe you could say the same for Victoria 3, but the story in Victoria 3 is the textile mills were really profitable and the government raised minimum wages, meaning the people had more money. Whereas in CK3, it's something like, I assassinated my wife to give claims to my son so I could put him up as a puppet in a foreign kingdom, after which I fought alongside him to assert our family's dominance in the region. It's a no-brainer that CK3 will have superior role-playing to Victoria 3. I'm pointing this out to demonstrate that Victoria 3's insignificant power gameplay is garbage because it's bereft of value mechanically, and the game itself has little value roleplay-wise. The inability to participate in three of the four game mechanics basically ruins the game in my opinion. I will say that not every insignificant power suffers from this mechanical deprivation. For example, the Papal States, despite being an insignificant power, ends up playing more like a minor power thanks to their access to a coastline. You can engage in most of the game's mechanics with a coastline since you can go trade from overseas. The lack of interest still gets in the way, but it makes it much more tolerable. What that means is that in essence, any insignificant power with access to a coastline is a little better off, but by no means are they saved. That's my major criticism of insignificant powers. There are more which will come up as we go, but for now, back to Krakow. When it comes to playing this nation, I wish I had more to say, but essentially, find an industry with a high profitability and build it until it's no longer profitable. This will increase our GDP and standard of living, since most manufacturing industries provide engineering and machining jobs. You'll also want to use your authority to put edicts down, since construction taxes won't matter much for such a tiny nation. We'll eventually make a killing on income taxes and dividend taxes, but for now, the budget will be either barely positive or barely negative. We'll get access to a nice investment pool as we build up our industries for us both construction sectors. Keep in mind though, that although the pool will cover their construction goods, it does not cover construction wages. That means that even with a huge investment pool, you can end up in the negative in terms of the government budget. Just something to keep in mind as you plan your economy. By the way, if you're not sure what I'm talking about here, check out my guide on building an economy that I did for Qing. The principles in that video apply to all nations, including Krakow here. So that's what we do as Krakow. We build buildings and watch our GDP climb. I'm making sure to build up some steel and motors too, so that I can guarantee access to engines for railways. Without those, our nation will lose access to the Austrian market. So the only thing I can really say in terms of guidance is to ensure you've got a supply chain set up for railways. Luckily, there are even coal mines here in Krakow, although I wouldn't recommend building too many since Austria will most likely provide us the coal and iron we need for steel and railways. In 1843, I had a million GDP and almost 13 standard of living, with both still climbing. I also was able to build a few construction sectors thanks to the investment pool all my capitalists were making, I then hit 3 million just a few years later in 1848, and I'm also working on research to get better production methods for my largest industry, textiles. Remember that the big benefit of a higher level method is not the increased output, but actually is the increase in quality of job. Jobs which make higher wages benefit us by paying higher income taxes and by consuming more goods. When goods are consumed, it makes any industry we build more profitable. It also raises the average standard of living in Krakow, which encourages more immigration. With more immigration, we have more workers who can continue to expand our industries. It's cyclical, you see. This loop continues basically ad nauseum. I continued the loop until I got to 10 million GDP as tiny Krakow. I had a 17th standard of living, and I was now the 18th power in the world. I even managed to get the springtime of the people's event, and got a revolutionary victory. It was my first time ever succeeding in this journal entry, so I just wanted to share that. By 1860, I hit 13 million GDP and over 20 standard of living, making Krakow a veritable paradise on earth. I consider challenging Austria at this point since there isn't really much else to do with Krakow, so I started up an arms industry, chemicals industry, and munitions industry. I was going to use Austrian sulfur and lead to provide for the weapons that would take them down. That was my plan anyway. 
I then built up the 50 barracks of skirmish infantry, and I was going to try and take Austria down with my 30 million GDP and over 25 standard of living, which I achieved by 1867. Tiny little Krakow was growing into a major power under Austria, and yet with how Victoria works, going to war was simply a way to commit seppuku. My army was a huge expense which I couldn't reasonably afford, but I was planning to have the army defeat Austria then disbanded immediately. I would then join Prussia's market to get access to their market and pops which I could extract. I made one critical error though. I chose to add West and East Galicia as war goals to my war. This made Prussia unwilling to help me. That was the nail in my coffin, as even with skirmish infantry, I couldn't beat Austria's massive army. Because army combat width is determined by infrastructure, I didn't stand a chance. See, Krakow has a lot of infrastructure because of all the railways I've built. That means the hundreds of battalions that Austria has can overwhelm my 50 higher quality battalions. This also means I will eventually lose this war. My economy also is crashing under the immense weight of these military costs, and my businesses are failing due to my barracks sapping workers away to replace the casualties. As Krakow, war is anathema. At the same time, as a player, continuous peace and prosperity is anathema to fun. It's horrifically boring to sit around just watching numbers go up for a game as multifaceted as Victoria 3. If you're curious, guide-wise, what to do here, the answer is to keep building up the economy and sucking up to Prussia, then to get independence from Austria without taking any land, using Prussia as your ally to support you. You should then join Prussia's market and try to get an obligation on them with bankrolling. Once you've got the obligation, attack Austria for West Galicia, hoping to god that Russia or France don't get involved. You repeat this until you have your desired amount of power presumably with the goal of becoming Poland and Lithuania. The problem here is that playing the game well ends up being boring since all you do is build and build and build, then bankroll waiting for that 1% obligation proc. Once you get it, you steamroll Austria together with Prussia, and as your government budget expands, you can keep expanding your army. Do it one barracks at a time, unlike me and my rambunctious 50 barracks spam. I demonstrate this for you with video, but I don't really want to sit through the hours and hours of poor performance on Victoria 3 to make it happen. I will admit, this is kind of an admission of defeat on my part. I'm certain that I am skilled enough to make Krakow into Poland Lithuania happen, but I just don't really care for the accomplishment. If you want to see me show that I am capable of playing insignificant nations, I actually got the world record speedrun for Luxurious Luxembourg back when Victoria 3 came out. That video is available as a VOD on Twitch, but you can literally see that VOD and how I mostly sit around being bored. I'm not much in the wasting my time market, and if I sound harsh, it's because I am a little harsh towards insignificant powers. Thing is, I don't necessarily think it's bad that insignificant powers be boring to play. After all, they simply don't appeal to the intention and mechanics of the game. Why should Paradox make a nation like Krakow important when the game is all about huge stuff like the scramble for Africa and the Opium Wars? I'm strangely okay with insignificant powers kind of being a drag to play. In the future, I likely won't cover any of them because of this. If you're feeling stubborn and want to take a crack at them, then you certainly can use lessons I offer in my guides to help you along, since their principles apply across all nations, but I'd recommend playing at the weakest a minor power for your own fun's sake. Maybe one day Paradox could make some kind of DLC about insignificant powers to make them a little more interesting, although I have no concrete ideas on how to do that. For now though, I'll be sticking to the more important nations. Before finishing up here, let me go over the mistakes I made in my laziness. First off, I switched to graduated taxation once I saw that the profits on my industries were quite high. This was a good decision, but it also meant my income was now pretty much dependent on my industries being profitable. I simultaneously added in worker protections to raise the minimum wages across all industries. This meant the profits from my industries would decrease, since the workers were taking higher wages, and it would also shoot the standard of living across Krakow even higher. This is good in theory, but it had the unfortunate effect of leaving me taxless. See, at a certain point, depending on dividend taxes will harm you if your industry is no longer profitable. The combination of higher minimum wages and a reliance on dividends means my budget is suddenly collapsing. In combination with the new military expenses, this nation's economy is doomed. The way to stop impending bankruptcy would be to eradicate the army and get rid of those worker protections so that I could make money again off of the industries that could resume profitable production. This is an example of an inflated standard of living resulting in the death of a nation. I could also downsize my industries so that they employ fewer people and make profits again, but then I'd have a massive increase in unemployment, which would reset the inflated standard of living. Essentially, the lesson here is that the government budget, standard of living, and GDP sit in a sort of equation which can be tilted in a particular direction, but which can never get too out of balance. A low standard of living will create immense civil wars, a failing budget leads to bankruptcy, and a low GDP means you won't have all the goods that you need to support your industries. That said, you can favor particular aspects of the equation safely with some caution. So that's Krakow. It's a beautiful paradise of Central Europe that will now burn down under the weight of its own ambition. With more time and patience, it could have redeemed its heritage as the Commonwealth, but alas, the cost of weaponry is sinking the Krakowian economy, and the new minimum wage laws have caused a massive tax deficit. 
At the very least, let this be a lesson to you about expanding the military too quickly and focusing too heavily on standard of living. Part of me likes to think this video is a pretty good flip on the head for your average Victoria 3 guide. Consider it an anti-example. I'd be really curious to see how others handle Krakow, since so far I've only seen Lath and Habibi's attempt at it, and they're pretty much the only ones who have done it from what I know. Props to them, and I'd recommend you check out particularly Habibi's video on it, which was quite in-depth. Both of these guys have got more patience than I do for these sorts of challenges. I hope you enjoyed this debut video on the Giga Chad Guide video essay hybrid video. I'll be curious to experiment more with it in the future. For now though, next up on the channel will be more guides from minor nations given that I've covered a couple great powers, but probably never any insignificant powers again. I'm sorry if that's disappointing for you. Thank you for your time.